as we are, as vinci was taking us to the worship i was reminded of one particular uh, story i used to share before see in uh, in one of the churches there used to be a lady who constantly used to come and testify god spoke to me this god showed me this god showed me. and the pastor was a young relatively young pastor so he used to wonder why uh, this lady is all the time coming and saying god is showing me this god is showing me that uh, and how come i am not able to this thing i, I don't know i think uh, she must be just making it up okay let me test her okay. so he tells her he asks her does uh, god uh, tell you everything means whatever you ask and all that he says yeah okay you do one thing you ask him about my past okay in the past because he has done something a very terrible kind of uh sin which nobody knows only he knows and obviously god knows so he says okay there's something about my past ask god okay and let me see if he'll tell you and then i'll know that god is really speaking and then she says okay yeah i'll talk and next time he meets her and then she's just not even looking at him she says no he goes after oh what did you did you pray did you ask she says yeah yeah i asked so what did he say did he speak to you yes he spoke to me so what did he say he says i don't remember so that was what we sang about god forgives us so much he doesn't remember he doesn't remember he just takes everything away okay so wonderful thank you vincy for that song like when we when singing increases his grace increases all the more okay so now let's uh, we'll go back to our where am i okay so we uh, we are doing a series on uh, gospel renewal and in that series in my slots i was just taking us through uh, a mini series which is called the encounters of the risen jesus okay so we saw how risen jesus meets with people because all the songs that we sang and the faith that we now have was not enjoyed by the disciples when jesus was crucified they were all thrown into absolute disarray they were they, they were not even expecting that such and such a thing was going to happen and then how jesus revealed himself to individuals like first we saw how he revealed himself to mary the thinker then we saw how he revealed himself to jo- uh, mary the feeler and then we saw john the thinker just showed him just the grave clothes and with that he revealed, revealed himself he knew that jesus rose from the dead and then we saw thomas the doubter he says unless i put my finger i will not believe and see how jesus met him at his terms and then the last time we saw it was peter who was such a failure and jesus revealed himself to peter in such a powerful way and not just revealed himself he restored him and not restored him as a probationary he put him back on leadership because the moment he understood his false identity and he picked up the identity which comes from jesus so today will be the last of that encounters and i hope we can finish in this one session because i'm i want to keep it short okay otherwise maybe this encounter we look at it in two parts okay so this last encounter is the most dramatic of all encounters okay now peter was a failure but now jesus is now meeting saul saul this is none other than apostle paul who was earlier called Saul his his name was Saul and he was an enemy of the gospel 
he was absolutely going behind people who were preaching the gospel. He was absolutely the throwing time means people into jail and all that. Okay, let's see how Jesus meets with him and what ha- what is the outcome. And to help us to do that, I'll ask uh, Sunil to read us this short passage from Acts chapter nine, verses one to six. Meanwhile. Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to this way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he entered Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Thank you, Sunil. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord. Thank you for this amazing grace, Lord about which we sang about, we, Lord, really reflecting and the way that you work in each of our lives and you don't let go of us. And now, as we look at this passage where, Lord, you reach out to even people who are your enemies, people who are trying to, Lord, wipe out any of your followers, yet, Lord, your grace crossed all boundaries and you met with Paul. So today, as we look at this, Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, help us. Help us to pick up all that you want us to pick up and speak to us. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. So the first uh, talk I titled as Power of the Gospel, which is our intimacy with the risen Jesus, how Jesus tells Mary, okay, you are trying to cling on to me. In fact, This is not what you can be happy with. I want to have an intimacy with you in such a way that my very presence comes to dwell in you. And that gives you incredibly great power. And then we saw the reach of the gospel. That is where Jesus meets us where we are and takes us where we need to be. Like how he met John, the thinker, And how he met Thomas the doubter. And in both the cases, how he reveals himself. And then we saw the perseverance of the gospel where Jesus came to work in Peter's life through his failures. That means the risen Jesus works through our failures, the perseverance of the gospel. And today, I want to title my talk today as penetration of the gospel. Because now Jesus, risen Jesus is now entering the heart and life of the enemy of Jesus, an enemy of the gospel. So the risen Jesus changes the paradigm. Okay. So that is what we are going to see today. Okay. So in this short passage, there are so many points to count uh, consider in this first we see that uh, we see paul is persecuting the church in a very very horrible way okay he was just taking letters from authorities and throwing people into prison and we that is one thing we'll have to see we'll see why why was Saul persecuting and also this whole aspect of the dramatic encounter okay why the dramatic encounter what is it that We should see from this and not see from this. And then we look at the intervention of Jesus. Okay. How Jesus comes and the words that Jesus speaks. I don't know that we look at it. But then we'll see how Paul's realization takes place. And what is the outcome. Okay. So first, I want us to see this dramatic encounter. So Paul was in going with a dog determination. Okay. 
to wipe out. And the way Jesus met with Paul is completely different. Like kind of, there's a flash of lightning and he was struck down, he fell to the ground. Okay. But let's not see this episode to say that this is how Jesus meets with everyone. Thankfully, Acts records and Gospels also, we already see how Jesus met with different kinds of people. He has his own way. So how Jesus meets us is not important. What is more important is what is the end result after this encounter that we have with Jesus. Like in all these cases, you've seen, no matter how different the way that Jesus met with them, it all resulted in a change, the inward change from the inside, how Jesus changed people. So let's not uh, keep this as a template saying that, oh, unless Jesus comes and with a flash of lightning, he strikes me down, then only I will turn to him. Okay. So that's not the lesson that we will take from this. We'll take what is the outcome? What happened after this in the life of Saul? Okay. So now, first let's see why was Saul persecuting the church? Is he a wicked man? Is he an evil man? Why was he persecuting the church? So that if you see Paul after Saul becomes Paul, he wrote majority of the epistles are written by Saul. In that, he calls himself as a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was a Pharisee. Pharisees are those people who are so thorough with the scriptures. They know everything okay, about the scriptures and they are the ones who explain the scriptures to people. And Paul is a notch above everybody else. It's not just that he was teaching scriptures. He was so proud that he was absolutely adhering to those scriptures. He was following those scriptures. And he was highly religious, very moral, upright. And he knew exactly as per his understanding, what God is like. Okay. And he was so zealous for God that he just could not see this new group of people who are now coming and started preaching something completely different from what actually he knew about God. And he is an expert. And he just couldn't stand it. Because what does he know about God? He knows about God that he's a holy one. He's exalted one. And he's nothing compared to man. Okay. And now these guys are now taking a man, Jesus, and they're worshipping him as Lord. How dare? How dare that they're completely subverting the whole thing. And this Jesus, he went around preaching that all this temple, sacrificial system, this priesthood, everything is going to be abolished. And his whole life has been that. His whole identity was flowing from his adherence to scriptures and his practices of religion. And this Jesus has come saying that this temple does not matter any law. Like when the Samaritan woman asks him, he says, it doesn't matter whether you worship there or worship here. A time is coming where you'll worship me in spirit and truth. So for Paul, these things are absolutely unthinkable because the scriptures he was so completely relying on will become totally irrelevant for him if he sees that. On top of that, he claimed to be the Messiah. He came to, claimed to come to save the Jews, that he is the king of the Jews. And forget about saving the Jews. He died. Not just an ordinary death. He was crucified on the cross. Such a shameful death. A criminal's death. Like he knows in Deuteronomy, it says anybody who is hung on the tree is a cursed person. 
And this cursed person, these people are, how dare they're worshipping him as Lord. So he just couldn't stand it. So he says, I have to silence these people because I know who God is. I know what God expects. Because God expects very religious, highly moral people. Okay? And he exactly approves what I am doing. Okay? So, that's a, he's not thinking he's doing something wicked. He's doing he's something very... He's doing God a service. That is what he was absolutely sure of. And he was also sure that God also hates the people that I hate. He despises the people whom I despise. So, in effect, what Paul was doing, he was putting God into his box. He made a box for God. Saying, God, this is how you are. Okay? And you remain there. Because now, the gospel is completely changing the entire thing. And Paul couldn't stand it. And he has to defend and he is out to destroy this, the way, people of the way. Because they, that time they were called people of the way because they are completely different from the known Judaism at that place. Okay, So he wanted to do that. So now, making God and putting him in a box, we also do most of the time. We also think God is supposed to be like this. Okay. See, Bible says, God created man in his image. So someone said, so man returned the favor. What is that? Man created God in his image. So that's what exactly what Paul and we tend to do. We tend to put God into a box of our own imagination. Saying that God should come around this way. God should actually, if my life is going like this, okay, God should approve of this. God should approve of what I believe in. And God should also dislike the people I dislike. Okay, For us, it's more that God should be completely agreeing with everything that we say. When I pray, whatever I pray, no matter how that prayer is, God should listen. God should do it. So it's all complete. So when we have a God like that, it will be a very, it's an appealing thing to have a God who fits into our thinking. And it's very comfortable, very reassuring, saying that, ah, me and God are on the same page. So when we trust or when we believe in a God like that, it may be comfortable, but we'll never change. Because we'll never be challenged by a God like that. Because he's a God of our own making. He doesn't, it is not different from what we think what is true. Okay? And especially if we have deep convictions the way Paul had. Okay? And it's impossible for those convictions to change even if the convictions are wrong. So that is the problem in having a God who fits into our kind of thinking. If that is the thing for people who are highly moral and religious, what about people who feel unworthy? People who feel inadequate? People who have come through abuse? People who have, Means, how can a God like this, who does not go beyond our imagination, how can he come and affirm us and make us worthy and make us complete? It is impossible. Thankfully, the God revealed by the gospel is beyond human desire. It's beyond our imagination. It means he's not a God that can be conceived 
by us or he's not a god who fits into our box yes god is holy he's exalted and is a consuming fire and nothing unholy can stand before him it just disappears it just gets extinguished he is in approach in inapproachable light he is so glorious and at the same time this god is a loving god he is a just god and he does not let sin go unpunished and at the same time he loves us so much that he doesn't want us to be burnt up so jesus had to come jesus had to come and take that sin upon himself and take that curse which is supposed to have been our curse upon himself and die that death that we were destined to die and set us free and he did not stay dead that's the whole story the whole story is the story of resurrection so this risen jesus with his nail marks with his wounds which is coming and demonstrating displaying to everyone he is now a god who is now declaring look i am changing the entire paradigm whatever it is you have been believing in about god is completely different yes he is holy yes he is zealous for his glory yet he is loving and he is a just god he is not a god that who just winks at sin and okay okay the, let me just forget about this sin no because some of us make a god like how paul made saul that god is a highly loves moral people religious people and so our prayers are answered he shows favor if i do all this means i can do stuff for god and so god will now fall in line with what i want or some of us may even think that no no god is so loving no so loving that no matter especially this song that we sang where sin increases grace increases so everything is okay for him. okay some of us may be thinking okay or for some god doesn't exist but all no matter what our thoughts are about who god is this risen jesus changes everything forever risen jesus talks about a god who is sovereign a god who is holy a god who is just a god who does not tolerate sin a god who deals with sin and yet a god who loves and does not leave people where they are and he changes them transforms them and to be made into his likeness that is what the risen jesus is now coming and encountering people now he is now coming and meeting with saul okay so for saul to change from his deep convictions okay it cannot happen until saul realizes that the god that he is made and designed is not who he is supposed to be because real change happens only when we realize that we are dealing with a god who is not the way we want him to be but he is the way he is i think i told once one of the these things joshua when he is fighting the battles and then the commander of the lord's army he appears and then that's a christ figure and joshua asks are you for them or are you for me okay forget about that 
the question is on are you with me see we, we have to confront this risen jesus who is now not going to fit into our box he is the one who is going to come and say look i am the question is do you want to be with me okay so that is what is only going to change otherwise a customized god a god made to order will just sit in the box that we put him powerless for our sin powerless towards our attitudes powerless towards our condition and will continue to stay there forever facing whatever awaits at the end okay so there are some scary things about god of the gospel okay some things which are very disturbing about it and also some things which we have trouble accepting about i don't know if you have seen the chronicles of narnia there in that wonderful story that cs lewis writes he compares jesus to the he creates a character aslan who is a lion very majestic lion okay is the christ figure like in the story he shows how the lion defends people then lion dies and rises again okay so now this children are asking is he safe aslan is is he safe then he says who said anything about safe but he is good okay so our god is good but he is not safe the way we think safety is because he wants to come and change everything he is not going to come and get into the box that we put in saying god you can't stay here but he comes and say you get behind me and follow me okay and unless we are wrestling with a god like that okay unless we are worshiping a god like that unless we are actually encountering him in such a way we are dealing with a god of our creation and not the lord of heavens and the earth who created us so this is what jesus was demonstrating to saul he was so fully convinced that he understood who god is he understood what god wants and he was so religiously carrying out the things that he felt god was telling him to do because he was believing a god of his own making because god cannot be domesticated or customized he is untamed undomesticated okay but real and living and that is the first requirement for us to have a genuine conversion of the heart okay so this we can see in paul's writings later on okay and when he writes in uh, galatians i think galatians 49 you know what he says but now that you know god suddenly is correcting himself are rather are known by god see he saying but now that you know god now immediately is putting a phrase are rather you are known by god are you seeing the difference he says it is no longer what we think about god that is important but what god thinks of us is all that matters so that is the lesson what saul learned that is what happened to saul on the road to damascus 
So in one flash, okay, when he was struck and the voice coming from heaven means Saul's entire thinking is changed. Thinking means first thing is he realized this is God. So straight away he's addressing Lord, who are you? Lord, who are you? Means now whatever has been his life so far, whatever he has been thinking about who God is, now he has come to realize whoever it is that is encountering him, he is the true God. And now he's asking him, Lord, who are you? Because so far, he heard about the rumors about resurrection. Okay. But obviously, he did not believe. If he had believed, he wouldn't have been persecuting the church. And the moment that response of Jesus saying, I am Jesus, that would have completely changed his entire view of the scriptures because all the scriptures and the people who are worshipping Jesus were not fitting together. But the resurrected Jesus when he's put alongside the scriptures things make sense. It's all that what Paul when he sees the same scriptures of which he was so thorough, he sees them in the light of the resurrected Jesus. Everything falls into place. Means like he talked, he looked at this and he saw in Isaiah, he said, yes, Isaiah was talking about a, a Messiah, a king who is going to come and is going to rule. And the same Isaiah was also talking about a suffering servant who is pierced for our transgressions. Our chances, the punishment that was supposed to be on us will be placed on him so that we will have peace. So now, can these two be the same? So Paul's understanding is now dawning. Not that it happened in an instance, but just to begin to say that that encounter caused him to submit to whoever it is who struck him down. And then when he understood who this was, that it was Jesus, within three days, this same Saul is now going around preaching that Jesus is the Son of God. That kind of complete change took place. Means his entire paradigm has shifted because now he started seeing the scriptures not like a book of moral laws. Okay? Not some good moral stories which are saying, okay, the moral of the story is this. So now this is how you should live. Okay? And God favors those who live like this. Suddenly, in the light of the resurrection of Jesus, now He's seeing the scriptures as a beautiful story. The story of God's redemption story, which God has been working all along, right through, which was climaxing in Jesus. So now, the Bible is now fitting with the risen Jesus. Now, for Paul, his view of everything He's changed. The same people now he's persecuting, now he is now ready to give his life for those people because of his encounter with Jesus and his realization of who Jesus was. So now he, if you see what Jesus is telling him, I'm Jesus, and then he says, now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. Okay. So what does he mean? The moment now Jesus knew, the moment he struck him down 
And when Paul responded, Lord, that Paul is now ready to be commissioned. And now he's saying, now Paul's whole understanding now is that should be our understanding. When we encounter this God who is untamable, this God who doesn't fit into our boxes, this God who comes and tells us things which for us may be unbelievably true, true but unbelievable, something like a God who forgives sins as though we are not committed at all. A God who justifies by faith. A God who calls us into adoption. A God who makes us into his children. A God who demands our complete obedience. So that is the God we are being called to worship. So today, as we come to the table, okay, let's look at this God who doesn't fit into our, sorry, this is gone. He doesn't fit into the boxes that we put. Okay. He reveals to us who he is. Okay. He is beyond human comprehension. Okay, he is holy and exalted, yet he is loving and self giving. And he doesn't leave us where we are. He calls us just like where we, how we are. He says, just come, come freely, come just as you are. But once you come to me, I'm going to change you completely. I'm going to change you from the inside. Okay, so as we come to the table, let's look to these symbols, okay, of bread and juice, which remind us of this amazing God. This God who does not stay limited to our thinking. Okay, because Jesus came. He said, I am the bread of life. I'm the bread that has come from heaven. Okay, I've come to give you life and life in abundance. And he said, my blood, okay, I'm going to pour out okay, for the forgiveness of many. Your sins are going to be wiped clean. And now I'm going to bring you into a new covenant, a covenant which promises that he will never leave us. Of a second. So let's now reflect on these what we heard about the risen Jesus who changes our thinking. So let's see what are we thinking about God? Are we expecting God to really fit into what we believe or are we asking God, what do you want me to do? Because this table reminds us of that thing that has happened, which has changed everything forever. Okay? Just reflect on that. Pray with one another. Because the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and said, okay, this is my body, which is broken for you. Okay? And this is the cup of the new covenant, my blood which was shed for you. He says, do this in remembrance of me so that you're constantly reminded of
Father, we come to you with hearts full of gratitude. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this amazing way that you encountered us through your son. There isn't Jesus who comes in our entire paradigm. So Lord, as we partake of this bread and wine, I pray that you'll renew our faith. Help us, Lord, to keep correcting our perceptions about who you are. You are not a God who fits into our thinking. You are not a God who just is defined, Lord, by our boundaries. You are the holy and exalted one. And yet, loving and self-giving one. And you are going to, Lord, continue to do that good work that you commenced in us. And you'll carry it on till completion. That's your promise. And Lord, we don't want to be defined by anything. And because all that matters is, Lord, what do you want us to do? Help each of us to have this realization, this understanding of what Paul had. Lord, that, Lord, what do you want me to do? Help us that we will all, Lord, hear you and walk in step with you, be empowered by you, by your grace that, Lord, forgives us in every way and also empowers us in every way to overcome this sin and this death which tends to keep keeping us down, that we'll be fearless, Lord, children of God, Lord, taking your kingdom forward. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love, unconditional love of the Father and the ever-dwelling presence of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of us, constantly reminding us of who God is and who we are and who empowers us to live this life for his glory. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.